James chapter 4 this evening, James chapter 4. need to enjoy all this daylight. We've only got 57 more days before it starts getting dark again. <laughs> Just want to be a source of encouragement and joy in everyone's life right now. <laughs> all right, James chapter 4. Since I started that way, we'll talk about strife. Starting in verse number 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven. Lord, we do love you. We're so thankful for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, for what you were willing to do to be able to save us. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to hear the truth of the gospel. Lord, for putting this church right here in Anchorage. And Lord, this evening, as once again we come to your word for some help and encouragement and direction, Lord, we pray that you would do just that. Use it to strengthen us, to draw us closer to you. Lord, to be a help and to be real in our life. Lord, I pray that you would work. Lord, for those that are here that really just sort of blow off your word, I pray, Lord, you just grab little hearts. Let them see the truth and how amazing your word is. Lord, if there's anyone here who's not saved, Lord, we certainly do pray for their salvation. Lord, we pray that they would have that conviction and that drawing and that even this evening they would repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. May you be glorified and honored in all that's said and done. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. When I was... uh, uh, I, my very first mission trip that I did to New Guinea, I traveled with another missionary. Um, it was, I've been praying about New Guinea, but I, have, I was not surrendered to go there or anything like that. And, and, uh, but that was part of the in- intention when I went there. And I always had, I'd been praying about the country for years, and this opportunity came up for a mission trip. And anyhow, while I was on the mission trip, um, I was going to be there. I was there for two weeks, and I was going to be there the whole, entire time with the other missionary who was on his first furlough. He'd been there four years. He was on his furlough. Our church supported him, and uh, so I tried. We met up in Los Angeles, and we both flew over to New Guinea. It was supposed to be there for two weeks. About a week into it, the guest house we were staying at was a New Tribes guest house there in the capital city of Port Moresby, and the police show up looking for him. And both of us were there, and he heads outside, and the police want his passport. Um, I wasn't sure what was going on at the time. I was standing back on a sort of a porch area of the, play, of the place, and, and I do remember thinking it's not a good idea if he gives the police his passport. He can't leave. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what he told him. I didn't hear it, but he came back in, and he said, I have to leave the country now. And... Uh, um, and so he left. That's the guy I'm with, by the way, in country. I don't know anybody here. And he, he had to get out. He got on a plane. He left before they came back. Literally went and got in a flight, got in a plane, and went out. And then he had explained to me later what had taken place. He would end up not being able to return for his next term. And uh, the reason why he had to leave the field was because of fighting with another independent Baptist missionary in, that, in the capital city of Port Moresby. And they had disagreements that came up that I don't need to get into, but that led to him coming off of the field permanently. Um, when I started debutation, um, I was reading a book by, uh, I think it was the, the fellow at the time who was head of BIMI, he's since retired. And I was reading all that I could about missions, obviously, and you know, learning anything I could before I arrived in country. And in the book, it was very interesting because he talked about that issue, missionaries get along with other missionaries. As a matter of fact, the missionary involved happened to be a BIMI missionary. And in there, he was addressing uh, um, their research and what brings missionaries off the field. And their number one reason, by far, nothing was close to it, was missionaries not getting along with other missionaries. Strife 
that was coming up, leading them off of the field. That was far more than medical. That was far more than moral reasons. It was missionaries not getting along with other missionaries. And strife, of course, is a problem, not just on the mission field. It's, it can be a problem in local churches. It can really be a problem in our homes. Husbands and wives that constantly argue, don't speak, um, and then it's a different story when you come to church. Um, the strife is real, it's strong, it's present. Parents and children, especially once they get into the teen years, are constantly at strife. Um, it's something that uh, obviously deals with our relationships and, and, and affects them. And uh, our text, of course, deals with it. Our text deals with a very important question. Where does all this come from? Where does it all come from? Um, from which comes wars and fightings among you? He starts off with a great question. Why does all this happen? What's going on? Why all this strife in life? Many would say, well, it's all these ignorant people that are always around me. <laughs> you shouldn't have said that quite yet, because you haven't heard my next statement yet. <laughs> That's usually never the problem. <laughs> it's usually you have to look within. And I know Roy knows that, yes. <laughs> and, uh, um, but you, you have to look within. Um, in those cases, again, it's looking the wrong direction. And... When we try and solve these problems of strife, many times we go the wrong way. We're not going to the source. We think the solution is in fixing others. Um, if I can just get all these stupid people to change in my life, it would be a whole lot easier. Um, again, it's looking in the wrong direction. According to our text, it lays it out for us. We need to look within for the problems. Um, for the source of our troubles and what's going on with our relationships. The problem is not others. The problem lies within our own heart. And each of us need to look at this individually. Not that this is for someone else or for this person, but individually. Many times when I do counseling and relationship issues, the key is for me to get each person to look within, um, not at the other person. Um, and then from there you go to God. But there has to be a self-accountability. There has to be a, a serious examination of self. Um, and I brought this story up before, but it still, it still made me a little bit laugh at the time. I had one of my, I don't, know how, I don't know if they were newly converted or not right now. They probably were since that just came to mind, but I really can't remember if they were new converts. But nonetheless, they were baptized members of the work in Kudu Kudu. And I was coming around my truck, and I did not know that he had been looking for me. He was married. They had some children as well. And I was coming around by our little post office area there in Namatanai in the road, and I'm barely moving, you know, five, ten miles an hour. And he, he grabs his wife by the arm, and I see him dragging, dragging her to me and trying to stop my vehicle. And he has her by the arm, and he's dragging this poor wife. And, uh, and, and so I stop, and, and, and he lets me know right away she will not submit. Tell her to submit. And uh, now, understand our island is matriarchal. The women are, make the key decisions. So the men love the teaching that women are, the wives, supposed to submit to the husband. They really enjoyed that. I think that's why all of them got saved. I'm not sure. It was just so they could be under that teaching. Um, so, of course, I did not pull the wife aside. I said, the wife is not the one who I need to talk to. You're the one I need to talk to. So the issue actually is, is, is your problem right now. It's not with her. <clears throat> so many times when we're trying to fix relationship problems, um, we're going to the wrong source. Um, and really, you'll understand that because many times, uh, let's just say the person that you're fighting with apologizes. Um, and if you really haven't dealt with the source in your own life, you'll soon discover that it's not enough, that the apology isn't enough. Because the real problem was not the other person, it's your own heart. <clears throat> our text, though, answers the question why we have all this strife. What's taking place? Why all the conflict? And the, it lays out a, a th three key areas that answer that question of where does all this strife come from? All of them deal from within. <clears throat> it deals with a problem of war within ourselves by, number one, uncontrolled lust. Number two, unfulfilled desires. 
And number three, a heart that is not actually seeking God. A masked spirituality, a fake spirituality. So, let's dive into this here. James chapter 4 here in verse number 1, it says this, From whence comes uh, wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members. So here's the first thing he gives us is in verse number 1. The result uh, of this war, this lust that we have, of a war taking place um, within our own soul. And what's leading the war is uncontrolled lust. Uncontrolled lust. There is a war, and it is taking place, and it leads to this conflict. It affects our relationships on the outside because of what's taking place in our own soul. Again, according to the verse, the war takes place between uncontrolled lust or desires and your conscience. The war rages as you feel guilt uh, um, due to you seeking nothing but your own pleasure and your own selfishness and your own pride. Guilt rises. There's a battle and a war that takes place. Understand this. Usually when guilt hits, not every time, there's sometimes there are other factors that, that are controlling the guilt in a person that aren't right. But when guilt is working as God intended, listen to it. It's kind of like pain. I remember Daniel was a little boy. Where's he at right now? I don't know where he's even at. He was, he was a, he was a little, little boy. And we had a Christmas tree. And back then, the Christmas tree lights were a whole lot bigger. They were like these giant bulbs. And so the Christmas tree was near where the living room and kitchen had met. And I was there talking with Mary Ann. And all of a sudden, I hear Daniel saying, it hurts, it hurts. And I look down. He's holding on to one of the light bulbs. Well, the tree's plugged in. The light bulb gets hot. I said, well, let go of the light bulb. Oh, and he let go of it, and the pain went away. It was amazing how that worked. Sharon had to do the same thing to him this year. <laughs> do you know what, that, what the pain was telling him? He didn't need me to t The pain was telling him, let go of it. All right? Guilt is the same thing like pain in your physical body. When you're experiencing physical pain, your body's telling you, change something. Something isn't right. This isn't good for you. Well, guilt does the same thing for your conscience. It's telling you something's not right. Stop. So a war rages with guilt taking place, yet, yet we're obsessed with, with our own pleasure and our own lust. The war rages back and forth. So if you're going to resolve conflict in your life, the key is not to wage war with others. It's to rage war against the forces that are raging against your soul. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Listen, those fleshly lusts that we're dealing with there in James chapter 4, they literally war against your soul. They're the ones that want to control. And having your soul at war is a miserable place to be. There will be a lack of contentment, a lack of peace, uh, discontentment can control your life. And many times, understand, as he's going to get into evil desires, the evil desires are actually trying to feed something that it can never satisfy it. It's trying to get to a place of peace and joy. It's going in entirely the wrong direction here, but I'll get more into that later. Getting ahead of myself a little bit. But anyhow, having your soul at war is a miserable place to be. At the heart of this war, at the heart of conflict, at the heart of strife, and there's uh, other verses that, that point to this, and many of them will probably come to your mind as I say this, are primarily two sins, selfishness and pride. These give power to lust. Selfishness is controlling when lust is warring against your soul. We're taught to live for self, but that's not why we were created. We were created to live for the Creator. When you're living for self and you're allowed the selfishness to take over, which is a result of our sin nature, something that goes against God, 
when that begins to take over in your life, oh, the war takes place, it will spill out to strife in your relationships. <clears throat> because that's never going to be a key to happiness. And it will affect how you approach others. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's take two toddlers in the nursery. Now, almost all children, because they have the sin nature like we all do, exhibit a measure of selfishness. All right? But we all know there's some that exhibit a whole lot more selfishness. We do. I had five kids. And I know which ones exhibited a whole lot more selfishness than others. But you take two kids in there, and you have one who is moderate with the selfishness, but one who's very selfish. Which child will be the happiest? Oh, the, the, the one who's very selfish, never. You know, he'll want this, and be content for just a few minutes, and then it's something else, and crying again, and crying again, and crying again. It just seems there's never any satisfaction. That's correct, there isn't. If it is, it's short-lived, and it doesn't last. That lust will never be satisfied. It will not. It leads to this warring that's taking place. Again, how do you fix that child? The answer, answer certainly is always giving the child what he's crying for and feeding the selfishness. It's doing your best as a parent to parent them through it to teach contentment. And contentment is a hard issue that not only does a two-year-old struggle with, but there's a whole lot of 30, 40, 50-year-old that struggle with contentment. <clears throat> Again, we were not created by God to live for ourselves, but to glorify him. Now, the word for lust here is important because it's going to be a very different word than what we see in verse 2. The word for lust here is the same Greek word that is used to derive our English word hedonist, a pleasure seeker. So lust in this verse, which is one of the sources of strife, he's going to give three sources. All right, three different ways strife comes in and begins to affect your life in, re in, in how you relate to others. This one is dealing with a pleasure seeker. Lust here is the one who is seeking pleasure. We live in a time, as I mentioned this morning, where men are lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. We live in a culture that is pleasure-driven. Pleasure-driven. What's the next thrill? What's the next adventure? What's the next, you know, whatever it is. There's never satisfaction with it. And the devil uses that good because he knows as your heart begins to set on pleasure, he can begin to destabilize or begin to remove the very things that will try and put a foundation into your life, like church. Do you know why? Ephesians chapter 4, think of why the Lord gave us the institution of the local church. For the perfecting of the saints. If he can destabilize that by getting you to minimize church and put especially if he knows lust is in control, because now this type of lust here in verse 1, pleasure-seeking. Let me give him some pleasure to seek on Sunday. <clears throat> Again, the pleasure-driven culture that we have is proof that our hearts are controlled by lust, selfishness, and pride. See, our problem in our culture right now is not racism and politics and education. It's an issue of the heart. We live in a culture that now has probably more than a generation that has come up that has been feeding selfishness. We're seeing the result of lust controlled, or lust controlled, lust out of control. Selfishness is what's controlling the lust. Me, 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 me. Many times the strife and fighting and wars in your life are a result of your own heart because selfishness is in control. You have trouble thinking of others or seeing things from others' perspective because your own selfishness blinds you to what the other person is going through. It leads to conflict. Think of a Hosea's wife. I preached a series on the book of Hosea. Remember the first three chapters is basically the Lord is using Hosea's life as a living illustration for what the nation of Israel was going through or doing to God. 
Remember, Ho was commanded by God to marry her. Hosea obeyed and married her, knowing she would not be faithful. Over and over, trying to keep the marriage going, trying to keep things right. But you know what? She was never satisfied. I guarantee you, when she went out complaining about her husband, she never looked at her own heart. It was always Hosea. It was always Hosea. It was always Hosea. Never looking at her own heart. When the entire time she should have been looking within. <clears throat> she was never content, never happy, in a constant battle. It was coming out with her husband, but the real war was against her own soul. And you have to be careful. Because the time can come when the Lord grants you your lust. We see that with the children of Israel, don't we? When it talks about in Psalms, when he granted their request, but sent leanness unto what? Their soul. Where the battle was taking place. Remember, the most important part of you to take care of is not your flesh, it's your soul. You are a soul, you simply have a body. Don't let that body control it. Number two, here's another source of strife. So we had the lust, the pleasure seeker, if you will, selfishness and pride taking over. Verse number two. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war. And we'll, and we'll stop right there. It changes gears a little bit there from two and three. Again, now we come here. It uses the word lust again. You lust and you have not. You're, but this is he's going a different direction now. The, the word here is completely different than the word in verse 1. It has a completely different meaning. And that's key to understanding this verse to see what the Lord is doing and where he's going with this. This lust speaks of covetousness. It speaks of strong, intense desire. Contextually speaking, evil desire. Intense, evil desire. It emphasizes desire, while the other one emphasizes pleasure-seeking. This lust drives you, it controls, it's intense. Strife arises when your desire that's in control of your life is not fulfilled. Notice the wording, have not, cannot obtain, have not. It's when this intense desire is in you and those expectations that you're building aren't met. Strife comes out. Strife comes out. Because when this desire, because it's intense. That's what the word means. It's an intense desire. You can't get it. You have those expectations, but it doesn't happen. Strife comes out. <clears throat> and it affects other relationships. Again, when these desires aren't met, it's going to lead to great conflict in your life. It leads to murders and fightings and wars. The desire is strong. So when a person's, again, the expectations aren't there, they take action. Of course, it brings up murder here. You can think of the drug addict who would kill anybody to get his next fix. Um, you can think of... Uh, I, mean, I mean, there's mo many different examples of this that we can give out where you can see uh, one of the things behind multi a series of murders is, 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 is the very thing that he's dealing with right here. But murder doesn't, doesn't always speak of actually taking the life. It, can speak of, it, it speaks of destruction. The destruction of your relationships. The murder of the relationship. When your desires aren't met, you become Destructive. This is how this should take place and you don't like it and so the desire isn't met and it's such an intense desire that's not right. Anger takes over. And as we know from the Sermon on the Mount, an anger that isn't right is the same as murder before God. Listen, this stuff is so practical and so helpful right now. We're dealing with things that literally does destroy relationships. We learn here that when evil desires in control, you're going to make bad decisions. And it's going to lead to strife in your life. 
you get frustrated with those unfulfilled desires and you take it out on others. Listen, we can think of this, we can think of this in, in a different light. I mean, it is not the intense desire, but we can see, if you're not seeing it's very easy to see how so often what's going on in our heart, even if, even if the others aren't involved in it, we take it out on them. You can think of the time that, I, I, I can think of, uh, of a time where other things were, things coming up with church that are bothering, I can't get them off my mind. And I remember one time getting convicted uh, with Levi. I don't know what you were doing. He, he would have been this a couple years ago. You wouldn't remember this. Oh, you had a little rubber ball bouncing. Bam, 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 bouncing it everywhere. But I had, you know, there's a series of things going on. And I am just, you know, church related. So I'm sitting down on the couch, greatly bothered by these things. And these ding, 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 ding. And this ball's going back and forth. You can imagine what's coming. And I said, stop bouncing the ball. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then, I'm not kidding, conviction just set in. Because I knew uh, I'm simply lashing out over this right now. So I'm going to go lock myself in the car so I'm protected from sinning. <laughs> but it's true, these things, call, it affects us with others. And you think what it's dealing with here, all of a sudden... You know, you have the lust that he's dealing with here. He said, this is where strife's going to come from. You, you, you have this, you're not getting it, and it leads to strife. Thirdly, let's look at this. Thirdly and lastly, he says, you have not because you ask not. This is a different point than what he was driving at right there. He says, you ask and receive not, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Now, there is two things dealt with here, but I'm going to put them under the same banner, and I'll break them into two parts into this, but I'm going to relate them between what we see taking place at the end of verse 2 and chapter 3. They're two different things, but I'm going to put them under the same umbrella because they fit underneath the same umbrella. So this is another major source of strife in your life. And that is, he is dealing with your heart that is not actually seeking God. Really. That's what he's dealing with. A heart that's not seeking God. Many think the point of these verses are teaching on prayer. It is not teaching on prayer. Prayer is involved here. But he's driving at a greater point, the source of strife. Um, Prayer is a part of these verses, but this is not verses teaching us on prayer. It's teaching us the source of strife. It's teaching us here in this particular portion of the first couple of verses about a heart that is far away from God, not even close to Him. A heart that's being controlled by lust, that's affecting its, uh, the person's relationship with others, as well as with God. It's not only affecting your relationship with others, but how you approach God. Prayer is an application, but it's not the primary teaching. Right prayer shows a heart that's genuinely seeking God and what he wants. Matthew 6, 33. It does. Right prayer is something that's seeking God. A right heart is not concerned with selfish ambition or selfish pleasure. To put those two categories I've covered in those two worded that way. It is a heart that is seeking God. Not ambition, not pleasure. It's seeking God. And like the Bible says in the same Sermon on the Mount, the heart that is seeking God and seeking righteousness shall be filled. That's where genuine satisfaction will come from. That's where joy, peace, contentment come from. Contentment is not based on what you have. It is based on your character before God. <clears throat> Again, when it says you have not because you ask not, and think about this. Let, let me make this clear. Uh, and this is what I was alluding to a little bit earlier, and this, this point here fits it more. Um, it, it's not alluding to the evil desires from the other verses. It's saying what the person was trying to accomplish with those evil desires. See, the devil gets us off track. Still, the reason why people go to evil desires is still to find a measure of satisfaction, joy, peace, contentment. It's what we, it's what we go after in life. And so many people, though, use the flesh to try and obtain and to fulfill that. It's not going to happen. Those cannot do that. It's not possible. <clears throat> and 
And so this group here is coming before God, asking and not receiving. Or, excuse me, they're, they're not asking in the first group, as I'm getting on to the second group here. But the first group, it says, because you ask not. So they're not. This group is not praying right now. Because their heart is far from him. Prayer is always a reflection of your health, of your Christian life and walk with God. There's no other greater parameter or measuring tool you have in your life uh, of your walk with God than your prayer life. And because their heart is, is far from God, they're not, they're not praying. They're not, they're not seeking after God. It's evidence of it. It's fruit of what's wrong. So this is dealing with their personal prayer life, and he's saying it's not there. You're not going to God to try and find joy and contentment. You're not asking him about this. You're, you're, you, the, the desires you have, that intense desire, the pleasure-seeking, that's what's in control. Strife is the result. Strife will, many times is the real, result of a heart that's not seeking God. And one of the strongest ways this becomes evident is a failure to pray. You will never have a strong, strong prayer life that's true and genuine and have lust in control of your life. The two can't mix together like that. You can still struggle with it, have time because you still have your flesh, but we're dealing with what's dominant, what's in control. The pleasure seeking, the covetousness, the selfishness is a result of a soul seeking to meet its need apart from God, not from God. So you have this group, evidence that they're not close to God is the fact that they're not praying. There's no prayer life. But then it changes a little bit. Now you have a group that is praying. You ask and receive not because you ask and miss that you may consume it upon your lust. This group is out there. It happens all the time though. This group is actually praying. And they're, as it says, they're praying and miss. They fail to pray properly. The first group wasn't praying personally. This group is not praying properly. This group, too, is very far from God. They're actually praying about their evil intent. They're not even recognizing that what they're asking God for is wrong. It's not even right. That's how far from God they are. It's, it's like it's a, you can see the, the, the stepping down here taking place. And he's saying, listen, and he's answering the question, where does strife come from? When you get into pleasure seeking, when you get into just lust taking over, and your heart's getting far from God, the result is always going to be strife. Because you're never going to find a measure of contentment, a measure of true joy and satisfaction. It's going to affect how you relate to others. And then you mix that with different personalities that come into play. Strife takes place in different ways. We're not, we don't all respond to each other in the same way. Regardless of that, though, however it tends to manifest itself different based on our personality and upbringings and our life experiences, it, it's still the same conclusion. Strife. Problems. No contentment. This group in verse 3, they're actually praying, but they're not praying properly. These are the prayers that, you know, bounce off the ceilings and come right back. The Lord will have nothing to do with them. <clears throat> they're actually going to God to get help fulfilling their lust. There's two things here we see about this group of people. One, they certainly have deceived themselves. They have. To be able to do this, they have a, a, there's a large measure of self-deception taking place. Listen, we know that that's easy. I, I, I mean, it, it really is. Uh, you, you can come back into verse 22, the same book. It says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You can get to a place where you're simply deceiving your own self. That's all that's taking place. Just a measure of self-deception. They're going to God to fulfill their own lust. They're self-deceived. 
what they believe they're seeking from God Almighty is right. So much so that they're praying and asking God to fulfill it. They fail to see the root of their prayer life is their own selfishness. Listen to this. The, the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done in earth. As you've heard me say many times, God is not your genie in a bottle. But that's what's happening here. You ever seen those clips? I'm thinking of it because when I was studying for the, a couple weeks ago, right before the revival on Sunday morning, when I was looking at the uh, healing of the lame man in Acts chapter 3. Remember I showed the, the uh, ridiculous uh, uh, Oral Roberts and Copeland and, you know, it, as he mocks that verse and people didn't walk out, instead of saying silver and gold have I none, like Peter's point was to the lame man. He has something of much greater value. In his stupidity, Oral Roberts proclaims, silver and gold have I plenty. And along those lines, there were several different clips that, and I would watch with just such thinking, wow, the entire church is built upon selfishness and greed. Clips of, of preachers proclaiming the prosperity gospel and how God has us here right now as his children and God's going to take the money of the wicked to give to us. And everybody's shouting. All about greed and covetousness and money and getting more. Amazing. Now, there could be one other option here with them that they're not deceived and they're actually trying to live on the fence. In other words, it's, it, there's a possibility here that they're not deceived in thinking it's right, but what they're trying to do is balance living in two worlds at the same time. Trying to still please God and yet live for the world. You can't do it. You can't mix these. It's not possible. This is, as with the other group, it's fake spirituality. They veil their lust in spirituality. This happens all the time. Those who veil their own pride, their own selfishness, their own lack, of, their own evil desires, they veil it in a measure of spirituality. Judas did this, did he not? When he saw the waste of the perfume. Boy, we could have, we could have sold that and given so much to the poor. He didn't care about the poor, the Bible says. He was a thief who held the bag. He wanted money. But he was veiling in this fake spirituality. You know, when, when Aaron and Miriam challenged Moses about his wife, it wasn't about his wife. It, 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 they, 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 it was a mass spirituality. It was fake. It was about their jealousness of Moses' power. The Pharisees were great at it. But so often... We can, and, and many times it comes out in different places to a smaller degree than what I just gave. Sometimes it comes out in, even, in, even in testimony time. It can, of how great you are. <laughs> Listen, this is a reality. So there's, there's a possibility that why they're asking here is not that they're deceived. It's just trying to balance two worlds that don't go together. Like the Lord said, you can't live for both. It's one or the other. One or the other. You can't live for both. So anyhow, what we have here taking place is three things that lead to strife in our life. Uncontrolled lust, unfulfilled desires. All right, uncontrolled lust that's out of control, verse one. Unfulfilled desires, that intense desire that's not getting fulfilled. And a heart that is not seeking God that will always spill out into your relationships and it's going to produce lust. And you can just see it. You can just picture, I mean, it makes so much sense when you're coming here. Again, the, the unfulfilled expectations aren't taking place. The evil's desires are there. They're not getting met. It's, it's just floods over. Selfishness leads to fightings and war, to sum it up. The answer in your heart, if you find yourself always in strife, is not to wage war on others. It's to start with your own soul. The answer is to begin to seek God, to beg Him to help you with it, to beg you. Many times, it, many times it's praying, Lord, open my eyes to see me for who I am. 
let me see myself for who I am because I can't. Because just like Christ said, so often we can see, you know, the small uh, moat in somebody else's eye, but we got the beam in our own eye that we're not seeing. Lord, just let me see me for who I am a little bit. We begin to seek God. We begin to try and wage the war, not against others in our life, but against our own self. The lust and the flesh. The key is to look inside of you, not outside of you for the problem. That's always going to be the key, with heads bowed and eyes closed. The Bible can be so incredibly practical. We all, to different measure and at different times, struggle with strife and... uh, But boy, we've really got some help here. How to deal with it. Is there anyone here to say, Pastor, please, uh, uh, still the issue of salvation is bothering me. I don't know that if I were to die right now that I'd go to heaven. This idea of conversion and salvation, please, I need you to pray for me. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Please pray for me. If I were to die right now, I just don't know. Listen, that's the most important thing you've got to get settled. This message was for those who are converted. But if you haven't settled that, say, Pastor, please pray for me. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Please pray for me. Would you just raise your hand where I can see? Let me acknowledge it and put it right back down. Anybody here like that at all? Just raise your hand for me. Let me see it. All right, Christian. If the Lord worked on your heart, you come and pray. Father in heaven, bless this invitation. Lord, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Page 174. If you need to come and pray, you come and pray.